Finally time, let's rank all the best picture nominees for 2024's Oscar awards. And it's crazy that this season is finally over. It feels like it's finally kind of dragged out, but this best picture lineup was very tough to rank. Um, after finally re-watching every single movie on here, or finally seeing some for the very first time, I have my definitive list on what I'm gonna be here. And it's gonna be my personal list. It's not gonna agree with yours probably, and that's okay. I definitely wanna hear your guys' thoughts down below in the comment section, as well as make sure to hit the like and subscribe button for more movie and TV content like this over here on a daily basis, because we will be reacting to the Oscars, Oscar night. Definitely look forward to that video, but it's been a nice buildup. We did a video talking about which films would I have actually nominated. We did a video talking about my final predictions. And now we're doing this one leading into my Oscar reaction video. And that means today's video is sponsored by Kalshi. Have you ever wanted to bet on something that you might actually be good at? For me, I have longed for the days where I could actually bet directly on something related to my favorite thing, and that is movies. Thanks to Kalshi, there is finally a way to bet directly on the Oscars, and Kalshi, which was founded by two MIT engineers. This is the first legal financial exchange in the US where you can actually bet on any event. It is basically like the New York Stock Exchange. Instead of investing in stocks, you can invest in things that you actually care and know about, which again, is something something that I would want to be. I am not a good gambler, but when it comes down to movies, I think I know my stuff. It's incredible that this is the first legal platform in the US where people can actually do this in all 50 states. Now, the exchange has thousands of users and has already seen more than $500 million of trading. Kalshi has a ton of Oscar markets where you can make money by betting on the movies and actors you're most excited about. And you can trade on things like, will Oppenheimer win best picture? Will Emma Stone win best actress? And will Christopher Nolan take home best director and a ton more. I've already been looking myself at making bets because I actually think I could win something here for once and this is how it works. So let's use the, one of the most interesting awards personally this season for me. Let's say you believe Lily Gladstone will win for best actress. It is currently priced at 61%. You can buy shares of Lily Gladstone for 61% and the price changes based on what the market thinks the odds are. Say you wanna buy 100 shares, you pay 61 times 100 equals $61. If Lily Gladstone wins, you get $100. If not, you get zero. You can sell your shares before the results come in. If the share price goes to 80%, you can sell 100 shares for $80 and make a profit even before the event ends. Kashi has many movie markets, including Rotten Tomato scores and markets on politics, music, climate, economy, tech, gaming, and more. It's the only place you can bet on the Oscars in all 50 states again, and you can sign up using my link down below or the one that you've seen across the video in this entire time. And the first 500 traders will get free $20 credits. As always, bet responsibly. We do not encourage or promote irresponsibly trading. Bet within your financial means. Again, hit up that link down below. Thank you so much again for Call Sheet for sponsoring this video, and let's get into my ranking. Coming down at the very bottom of my ranking is already gonna be a hot take for many of you guys, and that is The Zone of Interest, a film that I quite liked, but it's one that while has stuck with me in terms of its sound design and in terms of its idea and style, but has not really been one of the films that has been, I have to watch that again, or, oh my God, that blew me away. When I watched The Zone of Interest, I was expecting so many different things, and I say this as a fan of Jonathan Glazier, who I think is an incredible director, but The Zone of Interest for me excels in its technical department, but everything else I found to just be a little bit too long. It feels like a short film that was extended into a feature film and I think would have maybe worked better as a short. Now, let me get my gigantic pros out of the way. If you have not seen this film yet, the sound design is unlike anything else from this year. It should win sound design, personally for me, just for the loan that it is the biggest character of the entire film. If you don't have that sound design, then you are literally missing an entire concept of the film. It's one of those movies that if you were to watch it without sound, it would be a different movie for you. I found out that the idea of a Nazi family living right next to a camp is one of those ideas that, again, is horrifying and is one thing that gave me goosebumps while watching the entire film. And it's one that has stuck with me in certain departments, but when I look at this entire list, it's the one that I didn't feel that enamored by. And sometimes when I do do my rankings though, it comes down to rewatchability. 
this is just one of those ones that I just don't ever see myself watching again. It's a greatly made movie. It's just not one for me. Then we get into my number nine, which is Anatomy of a Fall. Another hot take. I understand. I know a lot of you guys are in love with this movie. I finally saw it for the first time like a week ago. And I, first off, she did it. Let, let's just get that out of the way. But second off, the movie is greatly told. It's a great court procedural drama. And I love court procedural dramas. They're always entertaining to watch. And Anatomy of a Fall is like no different on that getting out of my issues out of the way on why this is probably lower on the list is just flat out it, it's too long uh two hours and like 45 minutes i i honestly found that at least 40 minutes of that could have been cut and made for a two hour film i understand that there's a lot of propositions to what it needs to do and personally for me i like that it never tells you if she did it or she didn't because then you can have those discussions and down below in the comment section or with other film friends or friends in general so definitely leave your thoughts down below did she do it did she not let me know i i think she did it, it was pretty obvious i really like that the director here justine really had a great idea with that and when you look up interviews of what she told sandra holler to play this character like she is innocent never giving her the direction if she was innocent or is she not i think that adds a whole other layer to her performance and it's one that again made me intrigued to watch the movie and watching the movie i can go as far to say that was a good movie i like that movie but it's not one that I personally would have nominated for best picture. And it's personally not one for me that is like one of the things that blew my mind away. Again, I know a lot of you guys like this movie, just wasn't my cup of tea. We get into my number eight and that is Maestro. Now, I think for most lists that I've seen, a lot of people have actually put Maestro down at the bottom for themselves. And personally, I don't get it. Um, I am a big fan of Bradley Cooper, and uh, I have to be honest, when I saw Star is Born, I was blown away by it. I wasn't excited for it, but it blew me away. And I was like, I can't wait to see what this guy does next. Then he announces Maestro, and personally, I didn't get too excited. Uh, again, a Star is Born was a remake, Maestro, feels and looks very Oscar Beatty to me. And personally, I'm just over Oscar Beatty film. And I took an early Saturday morning to go and see the film finally in theaters. After sitting down and watching it, I fell in love. Um, Maestro has been one of those films that while I did love initially, hasn't been one that's like, I've like gone back to rewatch. I've only seen the film twice. And I definitely still think that the first half of the film is the strongest aspect of it compared to the back half. But on a technical achievement, the film is absolutely great. I think the story here about Bernstein is one of the things that is fascinating to me, specifically as someone who's never really even looked into the guy. And I think Bradley Cooper and Carey Mulligan are stellar. The film just kicks off and it feels like an old classic Hollywood movie. And that is what Bradley Cooper as a director was able to showcase here. While I think his performance is great, I actually think his direction is the biggest star of the entire film alongside Carrie Mulligan, who is absolutely great. So happy she got nominated. Wish she had a higher chance of winning this year, but it just doesn't seem like it's gonna be her year. Actually, if you looked at Kalshi, yes, I said that. Maestro is just one of those things that I am just blown away by on that technical achievement. Everything in that black and white and the way that it looks like this perfect romanticized love story and then the second it switches to color it changes the entire dynamic of the story and i love what bradley cooper is able to focus in on bernstein's story but really focus in on the love story aspect as well and that for me is the heart of this entire story now we get into my number seven which is arguably one of the best scripts of the year and that is american fiction Flat out, first off, if it wasn't for Killian Murphy, I think Jeffrey Wright should be the front runner for best actor this year. American Fiction, this is like, honest to God, maybe his best performance yet. It's a performance that honestly took me by storm and American Fiction itself is just an excellently made movie. And it's one that I've continued to think about certain moments through it. And to see Cord Jefferson, someone who is a native to Arizona, shout out to you absolutely write this script but then also direct it all at the same time and craft a fantastic directorial debut makes me so excited to see what he goes off and does next american fiction is a film that brings drama and comedy all together in a way that i wasn't ever expecting and it's one that i think is arguably able to be made that it's the funniest film not just on this list but it's also the funniest film or one of the funniest films of last year as well. From the way of Jeffrey Wright's dialogue and him being this book writer who wants to, these very intelligent novels and no one wants to read them. So then he goes and makes this very half-assed book about the ghetto life and it blows up in popularity. 
after he uses a sue name and all this stuff and i i love that entire idea but i like that core jefferson didn't just settle on that he decides to also get down to the bottom and meat of this character and what makes him tick and on the other end we have his family life where he's dealing with mourning grieving he's dealing with his mother who is having dementia and all this stuff he's dealing with people moving on growing up moving forward in their life and maybe someone even new coming into his life to shine a light on it and american fiction carries two big weights of the story and while at the time of first watching this i had an issue with how they handled the dramatic avenue of it upon watching it again it kind of just sinks a little bit better in there I still wish the film was a little bit longer. Understanding the indie and the budgets that they get around these, maybe they just did not have the time to do that. But American Fiction is such a finely crafted movie that I cannot recommend enough to each and every one of you. Now we get into my number six, and this is either way lower on your list or way higher on your list, and that is Barbie. Barbie is a film that I loved. It's one that I remember initially walking out of thinking, oh, I really like that movie. And then as I continued to think and think about the movie, I thought so much more about how I actually came to love that film. And honestly, this is one of those movies that has only continued to grow and grow on me. And after watching it a second time, I actually should have put it in my top 20 of last year. It missed out by two spots, but I should have. I think Barbie is one of those films that a lot of people, you know, whichever way you want to talk about it on there have been people who have hoot and holler in their own opi opinions but i love that a film like barbie can actually bring that about i love that barbie was the highest grossing film of last year i love that people went and saw barbie and oppenheimer in theaters at the same time and did the barbenheimer thing there were so many friends of mine that did that it was a cultural event and barbie was a part of that and I think for me, while I don't agree that Margot Robbie should have been nominated, I think the nominees they basically got were pretty perfect. I think Greta Lee was the only one genuinely missing from there. And I think Margot Robbie's great in here. I think Ryan Gosling is excellent. I think America Ferreira is great in here as well. This film really excels and works when it gets down to the nitty gritty of its script and its ideas. And Greta Gerwig, the fact that she crafted a film like Lady Bird, Little Women, two intelligently great movies, and then takes this idea of Barbie where any other director or writer would have just made a slapstick comedy like Barbie and Ken going to our world and experiencing it. And while we do get that here and it's funny when they do, it has a deeper meaning to it. And seeing how Barbie relates to our world and what Barbies mean to people in our society and seeing then Ken notice how this society treats men differently. There's all these different ideas and different takeaways that people are going to take from Barbie. And the fact that Barbie can strike those conversations, strike those idyllic thoughts in themselves, and make a beautifully crafted movie at the same time, where in one way it's a comedy, in one way it's a blockbuster, in one way it's a drama, and it's all working in harmony, it's pretty damn great. And it's a movie that is fucking crazy too. Uh, Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig did not stirring away from the weirdness of it. Michael Sarah beating the crap out of people. Frickin' Ryan Gosling having a ballad and a song th in the middle of the movie. It it's insane to me. Like seriously, who's still not singing? I'm just Ken. I'm just Ken. Anywhere else I'd be Ken. Personally, for me, I am. Also, like, all the other songs are still stuck in my head. The opening dance party sequence, the What Were You Made For song at the end of the credits, which hits, and I'm like, what just happened? The film is brilliant beyond belief, and I think it is one of the best films of last year. Still, I think if this film did happen to go in best original script, it would have been the easy winner for that, because Greta Gerwig did such an amazing job writing this with Noah Baumbach, and I cannot wait to see what she does next again. We get up to my top five, though, and we got The Holdovers. Yes, uh, the Christmas charming movie of last year. The Holdovers, I didn't really know what to expect from, because I didn't watch a trailer. I, I just knew Paul Giamatti was in this and i went to see it and i fell in love with it uh it's a movie that i think opens its layers upon layers upon layers with every single one of the characters that you're experiencing in here because it's three unlikely people basically have to spend christmas break with one another and none of them want to spend it with each other uh you have dominic Ceza, you have paul giamatti and you have divine joy randolph every one of them 
are dealing with their own issues in a way. One's dealing with loss, one's dealing with loss in a way that's completely different, and Paul Giamatti is doing the same. Like they all in a way are dealing with mourning, grieving, something of that nature. And it's not all the same types of mourning and grieving and loss. And for me, the fact that they're all paired in this way, they're all three people who should never have spent time together and they're spending time together, understanding each other, learning about each other and giving each other different types of ideas and opening their minds to different situations and all crafted in that while you have those deeper meanings, those deeper messages on the surface, the holdover is just a damn good Christmas comedy. It's one that I'm going to watch every year now going forward. And I understand that Alexander Payne, the director, is like very much been like, this is not what I made the film for. Sorry, man. You do not get to decide what us fans want the film to be. And that's what I've really crafted from this. It feels so old school. It's got so much good humor. I laughed a ton throughout this. And I even got deeply emotional. The shoe scene that Randolph has. Oh, my God. Count the tears right now. Dominic Seza, who this was his first performance ever, just absolutely blew me away. I still find that he should have been nominated for this film. And Paul Giamatti, I mean, it's really been between him and Killian Murphy for this entire award season, and they're both excellent in this. And this is just one of those movies that I can't recommend enough. If you still have not watched it, please go check it out and make it your new Christmas tradition every year. Get into my number four, and honestly, I'm not gonna lie, four through two, this was actually really hard for me to choose. Uh, after re-watching all of these movies, this is the one that I'm still not 100% definitive in. Any other day, you might ask me to re-rank this list, and I would probably re-rank this list a little bit differently. I'm gonna stick at my number four of being past lives, which if you ask me right now, four, three, two, and one, these are all masterpieces in my eyes personally. And I found past lives to be one of the best films created of this decade and one of the best films created for this entire year. Uh, it's an A24 movie that focuses in on two Korean lovers who just really never had their time to shine. I think in a lot of ways, the film is going to open up differently for every, anyone who watches this. They're gonna experience something different. But the one thing I think we're all gonna experience on, relate to is love. Whether you take away that maybe you can relate to this in a situation that it was the wrong time every single time you try to be with someone, or maybe you can relate that the person that I'm with right now, this is the person I need to be with. And I'm so happy to be with this person, no matter what has happened in my past. And past lives speaks to all that and it speaks to the culture. But also one of the things that I really loved about it is the way that it builds up their relationship. You go seeing them from kids to kind of talking in college to how that college moves forward into that. And the way that they build it up to where this guy is coming to visit and wants to see her. And at this point in time, she's married. She's in another relationship now. And any other film would have made this like the biggest point of contention. But her husband like jokes about it and understands what is going on. He's not trying to get in the way about two star-crossed lovers. And that entire moment from when they finally see each other and they spend all this time with one another, all the way down to the taxi scene, breaks my heart every time. And the fact that you can have these moments and you can build up that thematical avenue with incredible performances, layered out writing, and not make you mad at anything, at her choices, at who she ends up with, it's not cliche at all. And it's not one of those things that is so generic. It's so well written, and I genuinely think Past Lives is one of the best films that A24 has ever put out. I love this movie so much. Again, another one, if you've never seen it, you should. Now we get into my number three, which is honest to God for me, one of the most batshit crazy, insane movies that I've ever seen, and it's Poor Things. I, I've almost debated on putting this at my number two, and in my personal ranking, like my actual personal top 10 of last year, Poor Things was higher than Killers of the Flower Moon by one. 
but I did rewatch Killers of the Flower Moon. We'll talk about that in a second. But Poor Things, if you have not seen this movie, I feel like this is a movie that if you have watched it, you either love it or you hate it or you just don't understand it. And um, I, I have a fun experience with this is because I told my sister like, oh, you should go check it out, like in theaters. She loves Wes Anderson. I think Yorgos Lanthimos has like a weirder undertone than Wes Anderson, but very much has the same idealistic touches to his films. And she went and saw Poor Things and told me that was not it. I do not know what you're saying. But then I've talked to other friends that I've recommended this movie to and they can't stop quoting it. They can't stop talking about it. And that's kind of how I am. I find this movie to be American fiction, one of the funniest films of the year, but poor things to be my cup of tea in terms of how hilarious it is as well. Yorgos Lanthimos for me, not just crafts his best movie, but I think this is Emma Stone's best performance yet. And that's saying a lot because La La Land's one of my favorite films of all time. Her performance in that was excellent. But poor things, what they were able to craft with the Bella Baxter character is unlike anything that I personally have experienced in my own life. And I love how they were able to bring it to life. That was crafted and made just like Frankenstein, but in an even more insane and honestly delightful and disgusting way. And Willem Dafoe, incredible as the scientist that did this. Rami, awesome in this as well. Mark Ruffalo, oh my God, like I'm so happy he got nominated. Just like, Anytime he's begging for Bella is like some of the best moments of this movie. And again, I understand this movie is not for everybody. It's so off centered. It's so weird. It talks about vigorously jumping up and down. <laughs> All those moments and more that make this movie so much to me and it's emma stone's performance personally in here for me that blows my mind away every single time i go back to check this one out it is one of my favorite films of last year if you haven't watched it it's now streaming on hulu and disney plus depending on what areas you're in so definitely go check it out now we get into my number two and it is killers of the flower moon i, I think i spoiled that in the last one um killers of the flower moon is directed by my personal favorite director of all time martin scorsese and I think this guy has crafted arguably a top five film in his entire filmography. And that's saying a ton because when you look at Martin Scorsese's filmography, it is layered with masterpiece after masterpiece. And this guy literally crafted another masterpiece with Killers of the Flower Moon, a film that earns its three hour runtime. Well, even longer than three hour runtime. It earns what it's trying to say in terms of the Osage Nation and the Osage County and how we treated them. And I love how the film never tackles and touches on and makes it be a whodunit. It's more of a who the fuck did not do this. And they never at one point try to humanize it any of the characters. I know there's been discussions that some people feel that Leonardo DiCaprio's character is humanized, but I've never found that. All I know is that what they were able to do with telling Leo's story, with telling Robert De Niro's story, with telling all these shitty people's story, in the background, it's always Lily Gladstone that you're paying attention to. Her eyes, her movement, tell an entire more story than any of these other actors you're even doing. And she's running circles around them to a performance that, again, like I mentioned with Kalshi, she's probably gonna win. So get your bets in right now. But genuinely, it's between her and Emma Stone, and those were two of my favorite performances this year. If you're looking at all the performances nominated, those are my two personal favorites that were nominated. And Lily Gladstone, for me, she is what makes Killers of the Flower Moon so important and so prevalent to all this. While she is not technically the main character, she's the main crux to every single thing in this movie. I've seen the movie about three times and every single time I always come out blown away by her performance, even though I know what I'm getting from it. The final moment that you get in here between her and DiCaprio is just perfect. And I love how Martin Scorsese decided to end on this story. Again, personally for me, I think this is one of the best films of last year. It's my second favorite best picture nominee, and I cannot recommend Killers of the Flower Moon enough. It's my number one, and I think most people's number one is going to be this, and that is Oppenheimer. For me, Christopher Nolan is one of those directors that is just like kind of Martin Scorsese. He just continues to craft masterpiece after masterpiece. There's a couple films in his filmography that I just like, but I think he's been on such a hot streak when it comes down to Inception, Interstellar, of course, the Dark Knight trilogy. Tenet, yes, I'm one of the ones that like Tenet. But after Tenet, I was like, you know, 
I love when Nolan goes big. I love when Nolan goes wild and weird. But I also love when he goes small scale. And it's been a long time since we've seen something like that. Some people could argue Dunkirk, but I wanted to see something on the prestige level. I wanted to see something on the memento level. And he came back and did a Robert Oppenheimer biopic. But in a Christopher Nolan fashion, it's not a normal biopic. It's told in different timelines, in different perplexities of what's going on through Oppenheimer's life. As you're figuring out one thing, you're starting to learn another thing and starting to figure out why this is tying to this. But it never feels confusing. The way that Nolan uses time in here, which is something that Nolan is so so in love with i mean seriously look at a majority of his filmography he, the guy's obsessed with time and i love it because i'm obsessed with time as well but the way that nolan is able to craft this story the way that nolan is able to craft this story with oppenheimer and tell this consistent and beautiful touching story and never falter away from telling a biopic but also a warning for the future is one of the biggest accomplishments that i think he can do with this movie three hours flies by imax 70 millimeter a drama for imax 70 millimeter and it's beautiful it's an experience you got regular people to go watch a three-hour biopic in theaters that's insane to me cinematography is on a whole other level the score killian murphy's performance all the performances in here but the thing that really stuck with me the most. And also, shout out to Robert Downey Jr. who's great in this. I, I am so happy that he's probably gonna be taking home that award. The thing that really works for me here is when I look at Oppenheimer, while I learned a lot about this guy's life, the thing that did make me take away is what he did, what is that transfix for the entire rest of the world? And what he did didn't just craft one of the most powerful weapons in the world. It crafted a warning for the world. And that last conversation he has with uh, Einstein and the way that they're looking at the puddles and the way that the puddles reflect at the beginning and the way that he's seeing him in the cockpit, you see all the missiles shooting over to even when he hears about what happened, what the bomb did. And he sees all those people's faces just being eviscerated. All those moments that make this one of the most memorable movies of last year and was my second favorite film of last year for all those reasons and more. Oppenheimer deserves best picture. It deserves best director. It deserves best actor. And this is one of the few years that while yes, I would love a ton of, a ton of weird upset, the film should win about almost every award. So I'm very excited that Oppenheimer made my number one and I definitely can't wait to get your guys' ranking down below in the comment section. So again, thank you so much again for watching this video. Tune into that reaction, head over to Call Sheet. Thank you so much again for them for sponsoring this video. And of course, with all that said, guys, stay classy.